So, okay, four minutes late, but sure. Um, yeah, uh, fun. We have 20 people. Uh, yeah, so my name is uh, Philip Lane. Uh, I am a Flux maintainer. I'm also, I guess, my proper job, I guess, is a, as a DevOps engineer at a company called Senet. Uh, we're a company based in Sweden um, that works with Kubernetes and cloud native stuff. Um, yeah, so these kind of things uh, kind of intermingle between my work or my day job and uh, my maintainership of uh, Flux. What I'm going to talk to um, about today is um, about the authentication challenges um, regard with running multi-tenant Kubernetes clusters um, and having Flux um, used as the deployment engine in these multi-tenant clusters um, and how one could like look at the different solutions to, to these types of problems. So just so that we're all on the same page, uh, let's first try to define multi-tenancy. Um, so generally, you kind of see two types of Kubernetes deployments, or at least I do when I've been working with this for a while now. Uh, you either have the kind of the, the, the two, two pizza teams where there might be a, a smaller company and you have a team that goes, OK, yeah, we're going to use Kubernetes. Great. Uh, let's throw up a cluster. We're the, the same team might be running all the infrastructure, the monitoring, the security of it, and deploying the actual, actual applications into the cluster. And that's kind of a, according to me at least, a, a single tenant um, solution, really. Um, and then you have these types of larger organizations that use Kubernetes to um, simplify the, the overhead that usually appears as um, the same different teams within the same organization might have to deal with the certificate and uh, ingress and DNS and all these types of things. And Kubernetes really shows its power uh, in those types of situations where you can throw multiple teams uh, into a single cluster and solve a lot of these platform problems for them all at once. Uh, there, there are two types of multi-tenancy, really. You have like the, the, the soft tenancy, if you want to call it that, which is like one company uh, that runs multiple teams within uh, the same cluster. And then you might have a, a, a solution where, where a, a third party might uh, host a Kubernetes cluster that has multiple different companies uh, running inside of it, where each company might get a single namespace. And that's more like a hard tenancy. Uh, either way, they, they, they have the, the same types of problems when it comes to authentication towards cloud providers and, and Git providers. Um, they might have like larger constraints when it comes to separate companies sharing the same cluster and how it, network traffic and data and memory and all that stuff is shared in between them. But there, there, are, there are still security risks when it comes, even when it comes to the, the, having multiple teams within the same company share a cluster as uh, you, you might not have a, a bad actor, but as somebody who, who from one team that might in, mistakenly affect another team's uh, deployment. Uh, and if we're going to lock things down with Flux from a, a deployment perspective uh, from outside the cluster in, we'd also want to have the same kind of access controls from inside the cluster out to uh, our Git providers. Uh, and then you might have situations where um, you might have a, a, a company that has, has multiple third-party vendors that are all deploying their separate products into the same cluster. And, and you'd, you'd want to have that type of separation. So how does this kind of look? Um, so from Flux's perspective, um, look, comparing Flux v2 and Flux v1. So Flux v1, if you wanted to do multi-tenancy, you would, you would deploy um, multiple Flux instances into each namespace. Uh, the, and that Flux instance would have a single repository that it, it would um, synchronize from. Comparing that to Flux v2, where there are now multiple controllers, uh, but you're most probably running uh, 
a single instance of each controller for the whole cluster. And these controllers are then cloning or synchronizing towards multiple Git repositories. Uh, and in, in the case of image reflector controller, they are uh, checking the tags in multiple uh, Docker registries. Uh, so you might see a, a situation where you would have uh, a lot of teams. Every team or a tenant might have a, a, a single um, Kubernetes namespace, uh, which is kind of what this is. Uh, they might only have access, they might have kubectl access to, to this namespace. Uh, and for that namespace, they have a GitHub repository that uh, Flux fetches the manifest from and applies it into this namespace. And then you might have a, a separate namespace. It might be in a totally different organization in the same, uh, same company uh, that has their own namespace and has a different Git repository that is, is clo cloning uh, its manifest from there. Uh, the issues here are, are, are kind of, there, there are different ways of, of looking at this. Uh, so right, right now in, in these types of situations, you, you would want to have separate Git credentials in each namespace that are linked to specific repositories so that um, the, the teams themselves would have access to a uh, single replica. Uh, yeah, so uh, you you would run single replicas uh, of uh, or single instances of each controller, and that's a, is more to do with controller runtime rather than anything else. There's no real performance gain uh, of doing it. I think you just introduce a lot of weird. Uh, race conditions if you'd run multiple instances of the same controller. Great. Um, yeah, so you'd want to have a separate Git secrets uh, that the source controller can use to authenticate towards uh, your Git repository. Uh, and and you, you'd, you'd obviously not want to share these. So you, you wouldn't want to uh, that every tenant uh, in the cluster has access to all the Git credentials. Um, for, for all the different tenants. Um, yeah, so so the challenge that we're really facing here is it isn't running multi-tenant flux. The, the discussion so far has been around Kubernetes RBAC and how RBAC is supposed to be applied so that uh, a team can escalate privileges and uh, modify resources without with, outside of their own scope. But I think the bigger problem is really looking at how Flux interacts with, with both cloud providers and Git providers when it comes to how they are synchronizing their manifests from the different repositories. Uh, yeah, and as I cover there, you could add a, a global credential to all your uh, Git repository resources. Uh, so that you would, for example, have a, a, um, a global SSH key that would be shared across all the different teams. Uh, that might work, but you're, you're basically giving everybody read access to all repositories. Um, if, if you were to, um, if, if you were to flip this image around and some people might say, oh, so I would just move my Git repository out of the tenants namespaces, that might be fine, but you're basically removing any kind of uh, insight into the synchronization mechanism for these tenants. Um, you could share your secrets or, or share some sort of hidden secret to, to each separate tenant, but if this secret or this Git credential is, is still a, a global credential, it, it really doesn't matter. Uh, it becomes even more important if you're running image automation because image automation means that you're, uh, there is a separate controller that will commit changes back to this Git repository. So you would definitely not want to, in a multi-tenant cluster, share a credential that could write to multiple Git repositories. So you, you constantly want to have this sort of access control um, lot or idea of, okay, so, each team has access to from their individual uh, 
Git accounts. They, they have access to their um, GitOps repository where they can deploy to their namespace. So you obviously wouldn't just break this whole security model by sharing or having some sort of global credential that would give them access from the cluster to write out to these repositories. Um, yeah, so and if you want to run things like uh, commit status notifications from notification controller and within Flux, uh, that requires API access. So you have that, that kind of security um, concern. Uh, you also have, have, have the problems of how to attach cloud provider credentials to, uh, to different tenants. So in, in the case of image reflect, reflector controller, if it wants to, for example, pull, um, pull the, the, all the images in the registry, it would need some sort of credential if you're running your private credential. And that might be uh, a um, Azure service principal um, token or a uh, IM role through um, like IM service accounts in EKS. Uh, but, but most of these things only work from a, a, a global scope. So uh, what, what, I, what you would see in, in a lot of cases would be that somebody would attach a IM role to the whole image reflector controller, uh, which means that all tenants would basically have access to or be able to reflect the state of all uh, images within the registry. And th that might be fine for, for some people, but it really introduces kind of the complexities if you, if you want to lock these types of things down. Uh, looking at Git providers, the different authentication me methods that we have today. Um, so within GitHub, you have obviously personal access tokens. Um, they are linked to individual users. Um, you can limit the scope of access. So you can say, okay, so this personal access token has uh, read access to repositories and might have rights to write commit status. Um, what you don't have is the ability to limit which repositories that the personal access token is access to. So if it's your user and you're generating a personal access token and you're a member of multiple or multiple organizations, it will be scoped down, but it will be scoped down to all the organizations that you're a member of. Uh, this is the reason why GitHub allows some sort of machine user. So they, their recommendation is to create a machine user, uh, give that machine user specific repository permissions uh, and generate a token with a specific scope. Uh, the other uh, authentication method within GitHub is to use deploy keys. Uh, deploy keys is something that's also recommended uh, within the Flux documentation. So what deploy keys allows you to do is you can create or you generate an SSH key and you attach it to a repository and that this SSH key basically gives you read write access to the repository. Um, and, and that works for a lot of people. Uh, one interesting side effect of deploy keys is that the deploy key itself is from, from a security perspective attached to the user that has generated or attached that deploy key. So if I create a personal access token, use that to authenticate to the GitHub API to create or to add the deploy key, and then I go and I remove my personal access token, the deploy key is also removed. So that becomes a, 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 an extra step of hassles uh, that, that you have to kind of work through. Um, and additionally with that, the deploy keys really just gives you Git access. It doesn't give you API access in any way. And then you have GitHub applications. Uh, GitHub applications is, is really an interesting concept where you could technically create a GitHub application that is organization specific. Uh, I don't think everybody knows this, but you there it is. There is a method of generating a private key from a GitHub application, attaching it to an organization, and from that private key, generating a, a JWT or JWT token that you can authenticate to your um, your towards the GitHub API with and to the Git API uh, with. Um, the nice thing with GitHub applications is that when you install a GitHub application, you 
both set the scope of the permissions and the repositories that it has access to. So it's, it's kind of the, the optimal solution. The downside of it is that these tokens have to be generated every 10 minutes. Um, so you have to build something that, that generates these tokens every 10 minutes uh, because out of the box, GitHub applications wouldn't work with, with Flux. Looking at other Git providers, you have Azure DevOps. Azure DevOps has this support, the same thing with personal access tokens. Um, they're also uh, scoped within the organization that, that the user is a member of. Uh, Flux supports Bitbucket. Yes, it does. I, I'm not sure if it supports, um, Flux supports basically any Git provider. It's more of a question if Flux supports, uh, the Flux CLI supports the installation on it in an easy way. Uh, so there, there are a set of Git providers that Flux has documentation for, for how you install Flux. Uh, but then there are uh, kind of caveats in that. Uh, for GitLab, uh, you, you have GitLab has actually a lot of support for different types of solutions. So it has like project and, and, and like public or global specific uh, deploy keys. And you can also create group and project deploy tokens. So deploy tokens are like API tokens. Uh, I'm, I'm not sure if, if these are limited within the enterprise solutions of GitLab still. They used to be at least. Uh, and they, um, they, they work in, in, in the manner that you, you would actually want to. So you can create individual tokens per repository, and then you can pass these tokens down to each namespace, and then they can just give, they can be used by the source controller to authenticate upwards. Uh, so yeah, so, okay, we have a question here. We use Flux V1 for a year and a half before I use sometimes the Flux Sync used to happen after 45 minutes to an, an hour and a half. Until then, we can't force to sync and any specific resource we have to wait until it reaches this snake space. In Peru, this problem the last, uh, so the question is regarding uh, Flux synchronizations. Uh, yeah, and it's it's totally possible to to synchronize uh, to force the synchronization of flux. Um, so there seems to be a lot of people here. Um, I will uh, maybe just jump through my presentation and then we can go for a more of a a open question session. I might sounds like that's might be a bit better if there are a lot of questions. Um, so yeah, and, and cloud providers are um, are kind of its whole own thing where you have credentials that needs to be attached, uh, and there there is no way of of assuming multiple roles both within AWS and IRSA and Azure and the AD pod entity. So that that is also a, a kind of a challenge today within cloud providers if you want to give specific uh, if you want to propagate up so that a specific uh, image automation resource has a specific uh, AWS role. That is not possible today more because of a limitation of the cloud providers rather than uh, a limitation of flux. But, but these, these things kind of become very apparent more so when you're running multi-tenant flux where you want to give limited permissions to individual namespaces, as I said before. So basically everything would be easier with bring your own set of credentials, really. Uh, just to kind of wrap this up, uh, we or I built a project called Git Auth Proxy. It is my attempt at solving the Git part of these types of problems. Um, what it does is that it generates uh, temporary uh, credentials that you can kind of pass pass out to um, pass out to uh, individual namespaces. And all traffic, Git traffic has to go through the proxy. It looks at, at the temporary tokens instead. And if that namespace has access to a specific repository, it will replace the temporary token with a proper personal access token. Or in the case of GitHub, it actually solves the whole generating every 10 minutes a JWT. So it, it will replace the uh, token with a JWT instead. So this is kind of how it looks, the configuration. Uh, so you basically give it a configuration. You tell it, I want to use the GitHub provider. Here is the installation ID, the private key, uh, and the app ID. 
you give it uh, the organization name, so we get a book organization and uh, the repository, and then the namespaces that should have access to this repository. So what happens is that it generates temporary tokens, passes them down to individual namespaces. Uh, then these namespaces reference these local tokens instead, instead of using something else. Uh, and then it is used when it when the git commands are called. It looks at the paths used and checks that, OK, so you are trying to reach a different repository other than Fleet Infra. It will basically give a, like a, a unauthorized response. But if you're trying to reach from the pro pro with the proper token to the proper repository, it will go, yeah, great, replace the token with the GWT token. And uh, all is well. So if you're interested, here is the link to the repository. It, it kind of solves a, a very uh, niche problem. I don't think everybody needs it. Uh, but it's, it's kind of a, a interesting uh, solution to, to these types of problems. So looking ahead, uh, we need kind of better vendor support for, uh, for GitOps workflows. Um, and, and that's kind of looking at specifically GitHub, because GitHub needs to support uh, repository-specific API tokens in the way GitLab does. Uh, these types of things are going to be more critical if, if more people are going to move over to, to a, a, a GitOps type of flow. Uh, cloud providers really need to support um, assuming multiple identities um, attached to Kubernetes pods um, or, or a way of, of, of basically switching the, the identities that are attached to them. So in the case of this example here, uh, the only way of, of, of basically having scoping down the authentication from this image repository to this image repository is to uh, have a static uh, credential that has a scoped permission. Uh, there is no way of, of giving the image repository a IAM role that uh, should be assumed by the image reflector, for example. Uh, and that's kind of one of those bigger challenges that we have today that it seems like that the most, at least from a access control perspective, the most secure solution to solve any such a problem is to have static credentials. And static credentials aren't really that great because people don't end up rotating them. So we end up in a situation where either you can have dynamic credentials that are constantly rotated, but you can, can't have access control, or you have access control and you have static credentials, basically. Um, yeah, and yeah, and and, and we, we really need, from a Git provider's perspective, we need uh, better better permit better ways of, of as I said before, uh, creating scoped API tokens that are not linked to specific users. These are from from Flux perspective. Flux is a machine user that needs machine access. Uh, so things like uh, multi-factor authentication, it doesn't really work uh, in these types of situations. Or, yeah, uh, it, it, there, there is a lot of work to do. Uh, and things like get off proxy is kind of a, a, a step in and trying to solve small uh, a, a small problem. I don't think it's the, the best solution as it adds to yet another proxy layer, which introduces more complexity. Before we get into questions, I just want to remember or remind everybody of uh, GitOps Days. That is uh, the 20th of, of October. Uh, it's hosted by AWS, D2IQ, Microsoft, VMware, and WeWorks. Uh, there are going to be a bunch of great people. So hurry up and sign up. Uh, yeah. So it's the 20th of October. Free. Do we have free registration for GitOps days? Stacy, you might be a better. Yes, it's free. Yeah, great. Yes, it's free. <laughs> great. Uh, so questions. You might do like this, stop sharing, and we can go like a rapid fire of, of questions. I'll go from the top of the ones that I missed. 
Uh, pods after Flux is updated, coffee. Um, yeah, so do I still need to use Reloader to restart pods after Flux is updated, config? Matthew, if you're referring to application configuration, yes, that is the case. If it's something else, you can write and I can try to answer that question. Uh, faces any suggestion for improvement? If Flux faces any error in and records it, Flux log file when have a mechanism to identify it and email the error snippet to the administrator. But to force sync a specific resource or so there there is a from so from the synchronization perspective in Flux V2, there's a CLI that you can force specific resources to reconcile again. Uh, so that's that's totally a thing. Uh, there is also metrics that export uh, from Flux now that you can uh, create alerts if a Git repository starts uh, to fail the syncing mechanism. So that, that's also absolutely possible. Can we sync Docker images from two artifact resources? Yes, you can. Yeah, that's kind of the, the, the big thing with, with Flux V2 is that it, it adds support for however many you want. Uh, so as long as Artifactory supports standard Docker API, this should work. Can we integrate Flux, integrate this Flux sync as branch should support only one branch for now? Multiple branches. So, does Flux support multiple branches? Um, yeah. So, it, within the Git repository, it's you or the, the Git repository resource. Uh, you can set uh, set a branch uh, that, that that you want to synchronize from. So, but that that's kind of up to you. Building like changing branches and things like that might just make things more complex. Um, yeah, from from a okay. So Matthew wrote here. If, yes, from Matthew. Um, so um, Flux does. Yeah, so Flux does not deal with things like um, um, config map reloading. So the question is kind of when Flux deploys something or deploys a pod and or a deployment, and you that deployment is dependent on a config map and you want to mount that config map in, and you update the content of that config map, how to deal with kind of reloading without kind of manually going in there. Um, there are two solutions. Uh, Customize has this concept called config map generator. Uh, config map generator, what it does is it takes the content of the config map, hashes it, and appends it to the end as a suffix of the name of the config map. So when the content changes, the name changes, which forces Kubernetes to reload the deployment. Uh, Another alternative, uh, if I can quickly Google Google skills. Uh, I just linked a project that you might find interesting. So this kind of solves the whole it, it reloading of secrets and, and comic maps when, when the contents are updated. So I, I recommend this project from stuck author called uh, Reloader. It's a great project, very simple, does the job both for config maps and secrets. So we were running it in production for over a year now with Flux without any real issues. Great. Do we have any more questions? And let's scroll up and see if I have Missed anything? Hmm. No. I guess we still have time. I think it's until quarter past. AWS code commit supported. Um, Last time I checked, yes, it was. Uh, I've seen a couple of questions about this for um, for it, it was maybe a year ago or so. Um, um, the, I think the issues with with code commit is is really related to in, in the same way of how um, other Git providers authenticate. Somebody can correct me if I'm wrong. Um, 
might be bad that this is recorded and I say incorrect things. But uh, code commits requires you, at least the last time I checked, to create a user that you would generate either SSH or HTTPS credentials, get credentials that you could then use, right? Yeah, so get, yeah, a get credentials helper is, I remember now, is one of those things that was kind of interesting where you could generate a, or you could have a role and then you'd have this get credentials helper that would do kind of some shim and generate a temporary token for you if that role was authenticated properly. Um, that's kind of been a, a, a interesting topic where I, um, I don't, I wouldn't say that that, that source controller would add support for for get credential helper i know that's been a question before uh, and i i know that it, it has uh we we've we've said that it would probably not be a good idea to add it just because of the the, the logistics of, of supporting it for for a longer time um and and this is kind of in the in, in the same um uh, in, in the same ideas of of other um uh, Rule assumptions. So uh, it's like gen these types of tokens would be um, dynamic. Uh, so you need to generate them um, like on a on a schedule, uh, which means that Flux would have to implement this kind of support, or the source controller would have to implement this kind of support. Uh, so the, the the I think the best solution there would be to build something like Git auth proxy and have a separate uh, operator or controller that generates uh, uh, get credentials for code commit for you and writes them as a secret. Uh, yeah, so questions about UI. Great. Yeah, so there is work being done on a UI for Flux. I will try to find it if somebody else doesn't beat me to it. Um, Let's see here. Somebody beat me to it. If somebody can link link it in the chat, we could. That would be great. It's sadly not in the top of my web UI. There we go. I found it. Oh, I hopefully link to the correct repository. So this is an experimental web UI that's being worked on. Um, I agree. It, it, it's kind of the, the typical arguments that you see is like Argo CD versus uh, Flux. And the, the big point uh, towards Argo CD is always like, yeah, so Argo CD has a, a UI. Um, that kind of has its upsides and downsides. Uh, partially, you're kind of introducing a, a another authentication um, complexity, if you want to call it that. So you have like, are back in the one hand that gives you access to specific repositories, but then you need to deal with access. You don't want to expose more permissions than the, the Kubernetes R back has given in the first place. Uh, I know that the initial idea of the web UI would it is that it would run locally initially, so it would use your local uh, credentials uh, instead of uh, running as a, a well a service inside of the cluster. Um, hey. Do we have any more questions? OCR tra uh, yeah, good question. Um, there is a open issue for this, if I remember correctly. It was a while since that was there. Um, so the status of that is really more a question of Helm rather than a question of the Helm controller. Um, so I'll, I'll see if I can find it. Uh, but but so there, there's been a couple of attempts from the Helm project some really good ones and some experimental ones that have tried to add like proper or, or OCI support uh, for 
or chart repositories. Um, a couple of cloud providers have built their own plugins that has just caused more confusion. Uh, there is a experimental implementation in Helm 3, if I remember correctly. The issue right now is that all of that API is internal. So they're not exporting anything, which makes it difficult for the Helm Cloud controller to add support for, for that right now. Um, yeah. For observed flux actions using Prometheus, um, any good recommendations for observability of flux actions using Prometheus and Grafana? Um, so the main things that I'm looking at today um, from the production clusters that I'm running with flux in them is uh, mostly uh, Git repository sync. So customizations can fail. Um, Helm controllers uh, can fail. So what, what you're really looking for from an observability perspective is um, making sure that all Git repositories are uh, being able to synchronize properly. If that's not the case, it probably indicates that these are a network connectivity issue from the cluster to the Git repository or a authentication issue. Uh, the other thing is checking that uh, all your controllers are running so that you, there's either some issue with uh, memory or resources or scheduling or whatever it can be. So, um, it's kind of, um, if I can check that there um, should be a Grafana dashboard, but um, manifest monitoring, here we go. So I would recommend you look at this here. That is a uh, link to, it both has some dashboards in it uh, for monitor checking metrics for the cluster and the control plane. And then there are some uh, Prometheus uh, alerts, I think, if I remember correctly. Um, that actually might not be the case. I, I think it might just might be the dashboards. Yeah. So the only thing that exists today in there is uh, yeah, just set up of, of Prometheus. And uh, but the, the, the most interesting part there would be the dashboards for you. I guess we have a couple of more minutes. Or how are we looking? It was a quarter past. Yeah, quarter past. Yeah, so if anybody, last chance to ask any questions, if you have anything, just fire away. Uh, yeah, that's a, a good good point there, Stacey. So then the CNCF. Slack, we have our Flux channel that's pretty active. Uh, so you can obviously, after this, if you want to reach out, you can reach out for more questions. But great, yeah. So there's 
nothing else i want to say thank you and uh, yeah reach out on slack if, if you have any more questions thank you